Oh, <clears throat> IDBM Challenge, Season 1, Episode 9. Why organizations have units that are aimed at rethinking the whole organization itself? Why do they want to destroy themselves? Because there's value in that. In this episode, you'll find how one organization in Japan is rethinking its future by drawing on its past. Enjoy! So my name is Kevin Kajitani. Um, originally, I, I'm an engineer um, from the US. Um, I'm actually American. Um, I was working at Boeing originally, right out, right out of college. Mm -hmm. And I was working on the 787 program, which is a, a relatively new aircraft. Um, I was working in aerodynamics in a performance team. <clears throat> so I was doing performance calculations, uh, design support, and customer support. So I was working there for around three years, I would, I would say. And then for personal reasons, I decided to relocate to Japan, at which point the timing just happened to uh, overlap with the uh, introduction of the 787 to ANA, who was the launch customer. And so that was an mm. opportunity for me to um, change career paths, and I uh, joined ANA in 2010, I believe. And I first started out in their engineering department doing the same type of types of uh, engineering uh, work. Uh, helping out with the introduction of 787 and then I got rotated to um, kind of like the human resources uh, section and then after that went to revenue management and marketing to do uh, database marketing so introducing uh, forecast models and, and machine learning algorithms for demand forecasting and then last year uh, I was moved to digital design lab which is a new organization within a and it's kind of like it's no not nearly uh, the scale or or uh, you know the, the the yeah the scale is completely different. But I, I like to consider it as kind of like the skunk works of ANA, kind of a an independent uh, body that doesn't have to uh, follow normal procedures or rules and and is able to kind of um, kind of research and, and and test out new ideas in a mm. relatively independent manner. So I've been doing that for a year and a half now. So that's uh, that's me. <laughs> now, um, yeah, I have to ask more about this. Okay. Uh, DDL. Um, so how do you? What kind of things are you guys doing? <clears throat> Well, basically, we uh, there's a few, I guess, guiding principles. Um, we have kind of three pillars that we um, are investigating: new business models, new service models, and also kind of like process uh, internal process innovations. Um, last year it was three pillars. This year we've kind of peeled away um, the process innovation because there is an IT department that can kind of take some of that um, load. Mm -hmm. So this year we're focused on business, new business models and new service uh, models. Um, but basically, as long as there's some reason for, there's a need within a a or a need in the marketplace that a a can address using the assets or strengths that we have, it's pretty much open to anything. So last year, um, things that were act officially announced, we launched a crowdfunding platform. We um, started working uh, with drones, um, started working on robotics, um, we started working, uh, we started getting into space, um, for example, and this year we're kind of expanding into, we haven't really announced anything, uh, but we're looking into things like, um, you know, AI and uh, blockchain, um, looking into sharing economy, mindfulness, um, things like that. So kind of whatever each I guess member within our group is interested in. Mm. We'll kind of research it on our own, uh, pitch it internally, and if we get approval, we get to, to work on it. So that's kind of the way mm. it's working. Oh yeah, we also did avatars last year. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty fascinating. You know, you're like really, I mean, yeah, sorry, with some of these questions are kind of, you know, repeating what's That's fine, been. that's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> but, 
I think it's really cool that you know you're looking like really far ahead in the future. Like, how do you, when you think about like these, I, like, I don't know how you call them, like movements or changes in the society. How do you know like which ones are gonna be like really huge ones? Like, how do you know like why should you focus on robotics, for example? Yeah. Um, I don't think there is any certainty. Um, in anything that we do. Mm. Um, but I think the same can be said about business decisions that are made on a daily basis. I mean, we live in a world where um, things are changing at, at exponential speed. And, you know, one of the, the projects I worked on last year, which was the Avatar project, I got to work with XPRIZE in, in the US. And that was a really great experience in terms of kind of molding my understanding of, of the world we live in now. Mm. And uh, Peter Diamandis, who's the founder of XPRIZE, he gave us a talk. And, and the thing, one, one thing that really stuck with me was he was talking about how, you know, humans for over 150,000 years have developed and, and evolved to live in a linear world hmm. where it's like you, the distance you can travel in a day is defined by the horizon that you see. And when you walk 10 steps forward, you move 10 meters forward. And that's kind of the, the way we think. We're, hmm. we're wired to think that way. But in the last, you know, couple of decades or few decades, um, we have quickly kind of distanced ourselves from that linear world and now we live in a world where you can travel to the opposite side of the planet in, in a day mm -hmm. and technology is uh, advancing exponentially. So when you figuratively think about taking 10 steps forward, you're not walking 10 meters forward, you're going around the earth 26 times now. Mm -hmm. And our, our minds just aren't capable of comprehending that speed yeah. and at the same time, since we're riding the exponential curve, it doesn't feel like uh, it's changing that fast. I mean, just 10 years ago, um, I think 10 years ago in June was when iPhone came out. And now we kind of, you know, ubiquitously think as, of smartphones as being kind of daily necessities. But 10 years ago, it was like kind of a joke, to be honest, you know? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were uh, discrediting uh, Apple's, uh, you know, decision to go into phones. And I still remember that, but it seems like such a long time ago because now it's just, you know, <laughs> it's like standard issue now, right? Tavis, yeah, this is smart. Yeah. Thing, so. Um, so in that respect, it's kind of more about not whether we have confidence 100% something's going to happen. It's being confident in the analysis that you create in, in a story. Uh, maybe that's a bad way to put it. It's impossible to be 100% sure of something, so you can only really be 100% sure of the current trends and you can only estimate where the trends will take mm. will take you yeah and and defining you know for example the avatars is, is a is an easy one to talk about because it's so crazy um people will ask us why is an airline uh trying to drive innovation in avatar technology um, this world will never come etc cetera, etc cetera. but when you actually do the research and you kind of go around you realize that no you know Telepresence and tele-existence technology mm. is up and coming. It's just underfunded. And here we are in a world where AI and robotics is exploding. And you realize that the technology, the components are all there. It just hasn't been integrated and there hasn't been a use case to drive that, that mm. integration. And then you realize, okay, well, airplanes, um, airlines are operators of airplanes. And our service, that what, what do we provide to the world? We provide long distance travel. Um, and and transport, but when you really do the math, you realize that you know the entire global airline industry is impacting less than 10% of the world on a yearly basis, so we're not actually doing a great job of providing that service. And so the mm. second a better solution, a cheaper, better, more dem democratic solution comes into the marketplace, um, I don't think airplanes are going to be seen as, as being so attractive anymore. And so. That, that's why it makes sense to kind of invest in, in avatar technology. I don't think that airplanes will be disrupted by avatar technology. I think avatars will actually um, help grow aviation demand because once you physically interact with somebody, it's just like email and, and Skyping. Those are both said to destroy business demand, but it didn't. It actually made business demand stronger because now you have a reason to travel and meet those people that you've seen. Mm. Uh, you've communicated via email and via uh, video chat with. So it's kind of like doing those kinds of thought exercises um, it's not a matter of knowing with 100% accuracy. It's being able to have a story that um, has grounding in, in facts and um, kind of 
drawing the lines and, and projecting where uh, the future will be. And then in that case, where should we as a company be positioned? Mm. And so a lot of it is redefining ourselves as are we an airline or are we an airline that connects people, cultures and bridges gaps of distance? Uh, for example and then once you kind of mm. redefine that then there's a lot of places and space for you to move around and, and you're not confined by um, using the aircraft to tra transport people so that's yeah. kind of the the mindset and the framework that um, we often use and that like when when you when you kind of when you frame it that way i think it really makes sense that you know like it's really in line with your story and it is kind of deep underlying reason why ANA exists, mm -hmm. uh, connecting people and, well, that was Nokia's tagline. <laughs> <laughs> now you can steal it now. Yeah, but you know, we, you know, ANA is actually a, a venture company, uh, startup. Mm. Um, didn't start off as, as being an airline company. It started with two helicopters, 16 employees in post-World War Japan when everything was kind mm. of a mess. And there was a national uh, funded carrier yeah. And um, it was operated by um, the occupying forces. Um, but the founders of ANA, they wanted to kind of challenge that and create a domestic airline. It started with two helicopters and their goal was really to reestablish regular transport routes. So it was kind of like this, you know, not CSR, but this very, you know, socially conscious um, mm. yeah. motivation. And I think that's what's really, I mean, for me coming into this company as a, you know, uh, in, in mid-career, uh, it was very attractive. I mean, this company does have a startup spirit still, and I think that's very difficult to find in, in large companies. Yeah, true. <coughs> and, 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 just kind of struggling or stuttering now, but, uh, so DDL is also kind of, you, you were initially backed or still are backed by your CEO. Yes. Right? And that's, that's quite rare, I think, that you know. Yeah, I think um, from my understanding, um, it was our, our C, current CEO of INA Holdings who was a kind of mastermind behind starting Digital Design Lab. And um, when we renewed our midterm strategy, there was a whole message from our, our CEO about how he wanted us to kind of remember where we came from as a company, um, kind of kind of um, revive those kind of uh, startup roots and that, that, that DNA that's, that's within mm. our company. And, you know, you've reported about, you know, Jan Chasa, right? He used the mm. word rebellion, uh, rebellious, you know, be rebellious, um, you know, kind of go beyond your boss and, and, and strive to create new value for the company and so and as kind of like a one of his um, what's the word I'm looking for um, I guess one way he wanted to implement that is by creating this this new department of digital design. yeah yeah and one like one of the initiatives you've been doing now uh, you mentioned before uh, Wonderfly. Mm -hmm. Could you tell a bit more about that? Sure. Where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderfly. Um, so Wonderfly is is our airline's own crowdfunding platform. Um, a lot of people would say, why did we start crowdfunding and why did we start crowdfunding now? I think those are the two most important questions. Um, why does a Why did ANA start a crowdfunding platform? Well. The economic situation here in Japan isn't exactly particularly ideal. Um, we have a declining population. Um, you know, it's becoming harder and harder uh, for new businesses to kind of start up. Mm. And yet, you know, Japan has been known for the last you know few decades as being the most I mean, one of the most innovative and, and uh, ingen ingenuous. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of great innovations and, and things, you know, craftsmanship, for example, that have come out of Japan. And, you know, I was growing up in the U.S. and I always thought that, you know, Japan was the most innovative company, country in the world. I mean, everything that was cutting edge, mm -hmm. you know, mostly, you know, cars and electronics, but everything that was cutting edge was coming out of Japan, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, for example, the iPhone, 
the parts that are going into the iPhone are still being made by these you know small um, factories here in Tokyo, for example. They're making these parts that can only be made in Japan because of the fine craftsmanship we have here. But yet, mm -hmm. for some reason, even though we have that much talent and and you know kind of just sleeping you know in, in, in society it's 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 difficult for us to stand out as being the most innovative country anymore mm -hmm. and, and i was wondering you know why is that you know why is it that you know other asian countries and, and other countries around the world are kind of outshining japan when japan still has a lot to offer and one of the places that i saw a deficiency was capital and you know, if you look at, for example, foreign direct investments, a large amount of investments are leaving Japan um, when investments from overseas are not coming into Japan. So yeah. there's a net uh, outflow of cash. Um, in addition, you know, capital investment markets market within uh, Japan are really small. I mean, just doing a basic comparison, it's like 35 to one compared to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, even if you adjust for population, it's less than 10 percent. And so. You, you're now in a situation where you have all these people who are trying to do things uh, differently or, or innovate or create new products or, or uh, you know, expand their craft, but you realize that they just don't have the money to scale. And when we were, we were working on the Avatar project, we got to you know, go around to a lot of robotics labs and, and, and universities and things like that, and they echoed the same uh, thing, which was, yeah, we have all this really cutting edge technology. We think that we're number one in the world, but the reason why our demo is this small is we just don't have the funding. We really want to make this into a human scale, you know, full size demo, but we really can only do this because this is all the money that we have. And so you hear stories like that over and over again and you realize, you know, there's got to be a way to kind of um, get capital flowing in a better way in Japan. And then when we were looking into numbers about, you know, venture capital, for example, you realize that 80% is corporate venture capital. So the majority of investments are coming from the corporate world mm, yeah. and not from the private sector, not from angel investors, not from individual uh, individuals, but from, from companies. And you look at the world trend, which is, okay, the crowdfunding is, is blowing up, uh, you know, personal, it's essentially investments, right? Mm. Um, and it's already outpaced angel investing and is, is uh, charted to outpace venture capital. And you realize, okay, well, Japan's the third largest uh, co country in terms of GDP in the world. There's got to be a lot of potential economically. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can find a way to match people who are interested in supporting people with people who have ideas, then we can really create a new paradigm within Japan um, in which uh, people who want to try new things, or these, we call them challengers, but these challengers have a new path to succeed. And why is that important for ANA? Well, ANA, our main business core target is business travel. It's not leisure, but business. Mm. We're a full service carrier. So um, it's important for the Japanese economy to be healthy. So instead of just standing by and hoping that the next Sony or Panasonic come, o come along, why not help the process um, by creating a platform that matches those people um, with, with uh, new ideas. So that was kind of the motivation behind why we started Wonderfly. Um, and in terms of timing, well, you know, Japan is still starting to learn about crowdfunding so it's not as established as it is in other parts of the world so it's a proven business model that is i think ripe to to bring to japan at this time mm. um, and when we decided to launch wonderfly we realized well we can't just do just wonderfly because that's just you know we can't just do a crowdfunding platform mm. what's what's yeah. so interesting about that right that, that's kind of how, how do we create some additional value to the crowdfunding service that is more kind of um, a and A-ish, you know, like, you know, we're a service company and, and we're all about creating, you know, hospitality and, 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 and going above and beyond the call of duty and it doesn't seem right to just provide a crowdfunding platform. Yeah. So we decided yeah. to expand the scope to supporting um, challengers before they actually submit their ideas to a crowdfunding platform. So we run these competitions, uh, like the ones I was mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. um, where we set a theme, people um, submit their ideas, and if they pass our, our screening, we give them the equivalent of about 10,000 US dollars to prototype their idea. So instead of now uh, funding, fundraising on a crowdfunding platform to prototype your idea, you now have a prototype that you can fund to scale, right? So mm -hmm. kind of you skip one step, and I think it helps to not only um, spur innovation, but also it's good for the supporters, right, to the, of these campaigns because now there's a higher chance of success in actually getting the returns that you've um, you've requested. 
And then once these things are, are successfully crowdfunded, you know, we have a global network um, and we also have, you know, uh, e-commerce sites and in-flight sales and, and airport shops and things like that. We have a lot of places where we can help uh, potentially to sell some of these ideas. And so it's kind of like a full A to Z uh, platform to support people with new mm. ideas. And, you know, I, I realize that there's a lot of people in Japan who have really great technology or great crafts, but they don't know what the market needs. And crowdfunding is the perfect place to try out something with zero, you know, nearly zero risk. You, yeah. you, you think that maybe this is something that the market needs and that um, can leverage the technology that you have. And you can try it out. And if it, if, it, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, you can go back to the drawing board with, with very little um, pain. Right? Yeah, I think that, that's one of the like, really amazing parts of the market. And it's really easy because we have like the... Uh, we have all these elements, we just need to kind of combine them in the right way, you know. And, and kind of, I like the idea that you're really making it easy for people to try things out. Because, um, yeah, I mean, we, like, in the, like, previously we spoke about this, like, you, you mentioned the same thing, that there are so many cool researchers in Japan doing amazing things. Yeah. But, you know, solving their challenges also kind of provides, like, how do you say it? like that's your goal or its vision in a way like you know basically exist yeah that's so cool you know it's, it's kind of funny um for example the big earthquake that we had in 2011 um that was a really eye-opening <clears throat> experience for me because you, know, you turn on the tv and you realize that there is hardly any you know chain of command type of instructions coming down from the top. Mm. But you have all these communities coming together, helping each other out. And um, I think at a scale that is, you know, I don't think is, you can replicate in any part, other part of the world. I mean, it was just amazing how, how much people came together in their communities. And these communities became their own little kind of autonomous, um, <laughs> you know, con not countries, but, you know, um, autonomous groups of people uh, that were supporting each other and Japan has kind of that when in need help others mentality yeah and it's interesting when it comes to investments people don't see it as that people don't see investments as helping other people out they see it kind of as a closer to being you know kind of a risky um, you know, risky mm. business kind of you know Japan is also risk averse so there's kind of this how, how do you make something that seems very risky yeah something that's kind of you know in, in some people's view is kind of like a gamble right um, and how do you match that with the Japanese, you know, mentality, which is let's help people who, who need it. And I think crowdfunding is one of the, the best places to do that because it, mm. it's very easy to understand. Um, you're doing it as a group. Um, you're promised something. In our, in our case, we do um, uh, rewards-based uh, um, or return-based uh, crowdfunding. So there's something that you get in, re in exchange. So it doesn't, it's not really an investment per se. Mm -hmm. But it's really helping to get, um, you know, people with ideas off the ground. So. Yeah. Just like, how, how explicitly do you communicate this? Like, like you're trying to kind of shift the meaning, like shift the meaning that crowdfunding has. So like, kind of redefine, redefine. <clears throat> um, to be honest, I don't think the message is out that much. Um, and the reason being, um, it's been kind of difficult just starting, um, getting the project started. So that's kind of the main priority right now is to yeah. start the service, start growing impact. And then I think it'll come down to um, really getting that message out there. Mm. I don't really believe in like, you know, saying something without the actual, you know, yeah, yeah. the output. So <laughs> I'd like to kind of have some, you know, actual success stories under my belt before really pushing that message because I think that's when it really will be uh, easily understood. Yeah, and, with, and you've had now it for how many iterations? Two or three? Uh, just one. Not even full, actually. So it's a long cycle since we do kind of A to Z support. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a long cycle. We're closing up on the first cycle. Yeah. Uh, which started 
October of last year, so it's been, what, 10 months? Um, we launched the second one at the end of June, and we launched the, the third one at the end of uh, July. We'll launch another one at the end of this month. Mm. So we're starting to ramp up a little bit. Um, we're also kind of opening up the crowdfunding platform to not only <clears throat> having to start from the competition, if you already have an idea, you can jump straight into crowdfunding. So mm -hmm. kind of starting to grow the, the, the service a little bit this year. Yeah. Yeah, I saw some of those. There was especially this one I was really hoping, like I was really this close to uh, supporting that was it the, the luggage the suitcase yeah. yeah it was such a nice idea like super brilliant yeah but how, how are they doing now actually so um the suitcase uh, i did wasn't successful um, oh, but man. he went on to i believe showcase that at some uh design competition not design competition but some um exhibition mm -hmm. i believe um so there was some you know positive benefit there uh, cool. four projects were successful and they're all kind of in the uh, manufacturing phase now. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them have completed manufacturing. They're starting to already, uh, you know, send back their their promised rewards, mm -hmm. or returns, and then um, two of them are still working on on them. But they're they're wow. in, the, in the in the process. So how how does it make you feel? You know, to see that you know these these people succeeded, and and even those who didn't get enough, who didn't raise enough funding, they also learned mm -hmm. a lot because of you guys. <clears throat> How does that make you feel? It, that's an interesting question. Um, it motivates me to want to continue, but by no means do I feel that I helped them. Mm. Because it's, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I don't know how, to, how do I put this. I, I actually feel that there was so much more that I could have done mm. um, to help those people uh, fundraise that it's almost, I kind of feel bad <laughs> that I couldn't no. help out more. Um, so in that sense, I don't feel really all that much like a feeling like a su of success or anything by, mm. By, mm. by a long shot. Um, but I am um, happy that at least four of them were successful in, in the fundraising and that um, that others, for example, some, some, one of the projects, for example, they weren't successful, but they're still working on the prototype. Cool. And they said, mm. give us another chance. And I said, of course. Um, so that's really motivating for me. So if anything, I'm, I'm just kind of grateful that those, uh, projects, um, I mean, you know, crowdfunding platform is only as strong as, as the projects that are there. So mm. Mm. it's kind of, I think there's a bit of thanks that goes around, you know, not only from, from their side, but my side as well. Um, but it's, it was very motivating. It was a great learning experience. Lots of things that need improvement. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I really had all that much time to kind of let it sink in to say, you know, these things may not have come, you know, come to market, um, without Wonderfly. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. When I when I stop to think about it, it's just it's just motivating, if anything. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like this. I really like the the idea of this. Um, the fact that you know you guys are really connecting it with that with the kind of Japan's own like Japan's success as well. So it's not only about your company, but you know you see like your role in the bigger picture in a way. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, this is kind of like in the service statement that we, we set up, but, you know, when we, were t when we were really putting together the project and um, really defining why ANA is doing this, you know, one of the, the core messages that we, that came up time and time again is, you know, I'm going back to the, you know, startup story, but we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be Japan's largest airline if, if a lot of people within Japan and outside of Japan didn't believe in us. Mm, mm. I mean, um, that goes without saying. And so it's kind of, it just makes sense. It's, it's our turn to kind of give back to society in, in a different way. I mean, obviously it's a company, so we have to think about how do we do this sustainably. It's not a mm. donation program. Um, but how do we um, authentically 
to Japanese society, well actually to the world um, mm. eventually, mm. Um, but starting with Japan uh, in a way that's sustainable and that is authentically supportive. And so that's something that we've kind of been trying hard to achieve, I guess, yeah. with this, which is maybe one of the reasons why it's so hard mm. to get off the ground because it's not just providing a service that's cut and dry, black and white, if you fail, you fail, mm. you pass, you pass. Mm. We kind of want to, you know, be a little bit more a you know, white glove service, kind of a little bit more <laughs> high touch than other than other crowdfunding platforms. Yeah. Is this like one of like when you think about digital design lab in general? Is this one of your kind of aims that you know you want to serve the uh, the society and the world at large? Um, I I think so. Um, you know, looking at the other concepts that we're that we're working on. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a common message that we have. Um, how how do we kind of you know one of, one of the I guess the overarching themes you know, not only in digital design lab but A and A as a whole is how do we make Japanese Japan more you know genki? How do we make it more <laughs> lively? Yeah. Um, kind of re-energize Japan, not just Tokyo, but you know rural areas included. Um, and there's a huge business element to that, mm, uh, which mm. is, you know, if the rural air parts or, or non-Tokyo parts of, of Japan are no longer, um, you know, have a need for air demand, um, that, that directly affects our business. So, of course, mm, there's a mm. direct business uh, relation there, but um, I think it, I don't know, maybe it's just the fact that we're a service company in Japan that is dependent on the fact that Japan is economically sound, mm, is, is kind mm. of... Um, just by the mere existence of that relationship, it makes sense for us to um, be kind of proactive in, in not only uh, helping to re-energize re the economy, but other parts as well. You know, um, you know, we're we're involved in like sports, for example, and, and you know, getting mm -hmm. you know, trying to get more people to be involved in sports, and and, and I don't know, we. I don't know how to explain it. I think it's part of our culture, corporate culture, to be honest. But digital yeah. design lab definitely has that as well. And that's really like it's really amazing, and um, I find it really beautiful, like the way you kind of connect with your company's past and origins, and it's really present, and like really strong values. Mm. Um, yeah, that's um, interesting. Uh, so I'm from, you know, I'm from America, so my kind of, the way I used to look at work was it's, you know, nine to five and mm -hmm. um, I work to live, right? So it's like I go to work just to, you know, make, make, a, make a livelihood, yeah. or support my livelihood. <clears throat> um, but, you know, coming to Japan and more importantly coming to A&A, was a real eye-opening experience because there is strong community in this company, probably mm -hmm. stronger than, I mean, I have an opportunity to talk to, to people from a lot of other companies these days and everybody kind of says, wow, that's different than my company. Um, wow. But it's really like family here. Um, even for me coming from, from the outside, I'm mm -hmm. automatically treated as a family member and, and you know, for example, you know, we'll go out for, you know, drinks at night with, with colleagues and, um, you know, we'll stay out past the last train and you think we're, we're just chit-chatting about, you know, mundane things or, or joking around, but no, we're talking about how to make the company better and, like, that's like a common experience amongst uh, yeah. A&A staff. And so it's, it's a very, um, ver really motivating uh, environment to be in. And I think that's mm -hmm. largely, you know, I think that's really important when, when you're trying to do something new. There's a lot of people who are against you, mm, but mm. Um, there's never anybody in the company who is um, against simply the fact that you're trying to do something new. They're against it because that's going to impact operations or that's going to impact this or that. Mm, mm. And then it, it's, it becomes this you know constructive dis discussion about, okay, this is my perspective. And okay, if I fix that point, I fix this point, I tweak this, then will you be on board? And, and, and it becomes this like group brainstorming exercise. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, 
trying something new is, is always difficult. But at the end of the day, you have to have stakeholders or people who consider themselves to be stakeholders in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And um, the best way to do that is just to talk with them and to get their feedback. And this company, it's, it's, I think it's relatively um, a good environment to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not easy, but it's a good environment. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that's why, you know, I, I guess it keeps things very really interesting because, you know, you have this kind of desire to push things forward and learn from others, kind of, you know, expose your ideas to other people, and, you know, see how, see where that takes your ideas and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. how to change things. And, yeah. And exactly like these kind of stories, I think, like when you think about audiences outside Japan, I think people should know more about companies like A&A, &A, I think, because like, it seems that you know, there's like a really clear stereotype of Japanese companies, you know, like these perceptions that you know how things work, mm -hmm. but there's, there's so much more going on, I think. Yeah, well, you know, not only A&A, &A, but, you know, companies like A&A, &A, um, you, there's there's a large part of it that you really can't you know change. I mean, we're an operations company, mm -hmm. and our uh, core value that we provide to society is hinged on the fact that we provide safe, on time, reliable service. And so, just <laughs> by that, um, I mean, we have to make sure that that's the our type priority and so as a result it, I mean that's one of the reasons why DDL was actually created was that we are an operations company so as a result we tend to kind of make business decisions in, in sight of that um, uh, mm. of its impact to, to operations or you know kind of have the same mindset as, as an operation for example making one-year plans and if you know if you don't have your idea in at the time when when one year plan is created, then it's really hard to kind of jump in mid mid year to say yeah. we really need to do this. Um, but that's not to say that that's a bad thing. I think that's an extremely critical part of our business. It's really important to have that uh, structure and um, you know policy and processes. Um, so you know there's a lot of talk about how you know internal big company red tape. Uh, it's all bad, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's bad. It's just different. It's like what are you using that process for? Yeah, yeah. and and you know ANA's processes are um, You know Are working I mean that, that's why we have the The reliability that we have it and we need to continue to maintain that there's not a single day that we can take a break from doing that Right. Yeah, yeah. so um, <laughs> Of course, uh, process is really important, and and as as working in a department within that o operating operation company environment, um, one of the things that I think Digital Design Lab is really working hard at doing is respecting the existing process, not trying to disrupt internal processes because mm. that would disrupt our entire company. <laughs> We're talking about improving the company and growing the company and and. and and starting new innovations. It's not about um, destroying uh, what we already have. And so it's a really, really kind of, you know, highly choreographed way in which we have to work. Mm. But it's very respectful of, of process that we process that we already have established. Yeah. Which mm. I think is difficult, dif not difficult, well it's difficult, but it's, it's different than um, it's the mentality that I hear in other places, which is why they completely rip off these innovation de departments in completely separate locations, um, uh, not linked organizationally, and so forth, mm -hmm. because it's easier. Mm -hmm. It's quicker, it's easier. Yeah. But I think there is a lot of um, value in having this organization within the, the larger umbrella organization. Yeah, absolutely. It's difficult, but it's, it's very meaningful, I think. Yeah. No, I mean, it sounds like a design challenge in a way that, you know, how do you, how do you operate within the existing framework and, you know, reimagine, really like, you, you, uh, like you as a company, the same time But it's kind of like the difference between a startup, a real startup that has complete autonomy and can, can take chances and make mistakes Mm -hmm. quickly kind of pivot and not really harm their brand image, etc. Um, and a large company being the exact opposite, um, 
it's easy to kind of let's just you know we don't want to worry about this process and, and we, we want to work speedily so let's just come you know, let's be closer to a startup and let's just rip off and start off with five people but I kind of think that that's kind of running away that's kind of like a startup saying uh, I want to do want to see if this works let's get you know a billion dollars in capital and assets <laughs> and see if it works yeah I mean both are going to succeed one is going to be you know you're going to have an idea that doesn't fit with with the larger company and then the other one is going to likely be um a not very great product but you're able to build it because you have the uh i mean you, you end up just mm -hmm. swapping the positions right and that, nothing yeah. actually changes so to be able to kind of bring the startup mentality and the flexibility into the large corporation that still met, meets their uh, business requirements uh, matches procedures and process um, and benefits the company at, at whole as well as the, the the smaller project that you're working on i think that's when things start to become interesting right mm -hmm. it's difficult but it's interesting um, it's not a it's not an m a it's not a investment it's it's true like you said design how do you design that how do you yeah. Yeah. how do you meld those two differing ideologies into something that creates three instead of two right mm. Easier said than that. <laughs> We're still working progress. Progress. So, but I mean, it's just like you know this whole open-endedness that you know you have. You really don't have any idea that you know it's kind of you know exploring. Yeah. Exploring new ways of doing things. And yeah. Well, you know that's that's actually one of the stressful parts of the job. A lot of people say, "Oh, Kevin, uh, you have a great job. You get to do whatever you want, and mm -hmm. you get to dress casually." And <laughs> And I can't deny that. Um, I, I feel very lucky to be where I am. But, you know, I'm not here. I am having fun, but I'm not here to have fun. I'm here to mm -hmm. create value mm -hmm. for our company. So, um, you know, every waking moment, I'm thinking about what can be done differently, what needs there are, um, what, you know, new trends are coming up. And, and so, yeah. That's one of the, I guess, <laughs> one of the, I guess yeah. the more difficult parts. Yeah, I think, yeah. Somehow, I mean, I mean, I'm like not not kind of in a way. I can I can relate to that in a sense that when when you work in a university, like no one is really coming to tell you like, hey, you start investigating like yeah. you know retail chains yeah. or something. No one tells me to like what to do, so I have to kind of self motivate. Exactly. Yeah. And and most of the time it's really amazing, you know, you can choose your own working hours, but I mean then it's sometimes it's it's really kind of stressful, yeah. emotionally tiring. Yeah. 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 It's like a golden gate cage. Yeah. It's um I I mean that's one of the great things about again being part of a larger organization is I think trying to do something new is a very lonely job. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have, you don't have stakeholders. You have to find them. <laughs> you don't have yeah. people on board. You have to convince them. You don't have budget up front. You have to, you know, lobby for it. Um, you don't have a team, so you have to do everything. Um, and more, you know, above everything else, uh, you have a lot of kind of fear or, or uneasiness or anxiousness about whether the, the idea that you have is good enough or mm -hmm. is actually possible. I mean, people said Wonderfly is impossible. I was told that by majority of people I, I initially asked for advice from. Um, just operationally, it, you're, it's, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, and that advice was critical. In, in launching Wonderfly, because if it, if I hadn't gotten that advice, um, it probably wouldn't have been successful because I had mm. overlooked that aspect. And by getting that feedback, I was able to uh, adjust the business model so that um, you could take pressure off of operations. So having that community there as a sounding board, and also um, having the community there when you're completely just drained and completely lonely and kind of on the verge of depression. You can go out drinking with colleagues and talk about how, uh, how everybody in their respective roles is working to make the company better. Uh, mm. uh, but making the company better is, is, really, um, is really nice. And so that's another, I guess, uh, maybe 
nice thing about Japanese business culture and nice, nice thing about a a that I think if people here exploited a little bit more uh, would help to drive uh, new ideas uh, faster and, and more more aggressively I think mm. but it is lonely though yeah <laughs> I think you can you share that that experience but. yeah it's not it's definitely not easy yeah. yeah could you actually could you tell a bit more like you know you mentioned you know it's that you know it's something common in Japan right that you know you can kind of test your ideas or well what do you mean not test but um yeah you know sounding boards there's a lot of people you know people always ask what are you working on mm. I'll tell them they say what's that um expand and it usually doesn't end there they'll give me some sort of advice about well what they're working on and how it mm. relates to the project that I'm talking about something that they heard some somebody that they could connect me with yeah um and I think that's really really important having that community camaraderie um because like as again you know, I'm kind of repeating myself but you know doing something new is intrinsically lonely and mm -hmm. and it's being a pioneer is really quite depressing because there's nobody there to typically to mm -hmm. to yeah. to lean on or rely on um but you know on the flip side you know being in a corporation it's like people often say you become accustomed to having somebody else working with you, double checks, triple checks, and you become just um, kind of, you know, numb to to trying new things, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, that's again the design problem. If you can mix that pioneer spirit with with the good parts about you know corporate culture, mm -hmm. then yeah. now you're you're no longer in such a lonely <laughs> uh, environment, and you have people. There's always somebody who can help you out, someone who can help propel your your idea, um, improve your your idea, um, and in the end, help you launch your idea. I mean, there's you know tons of you know human resources and, and place people that can help. So, mm -hmm. leveraging that is is I think really important. And and in order to do that, and this is something that I learned after coming to ANA, mm -hmm. is you know how to um, how to I don't want to use the wrong word. I, I kind of believe it's you get what you give, so it's kind of give and get kind of you know you scratch my back I'll scratch your back type of community. Mm -hmm. and I think that's not just A and A, not just Japan. I think that's that's a, a, a common thing around the world. And I'm not talking about like kickbacks and, and things like that. What I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. is is you know when somebody needs your help or asks for your help that you authentically give them your time. Mm -hmm. um, and you give them your honest opinions and you try to help them um, that when you're in that same position that they will uh, at least uh, you know do what they can to extend that same um, help I think I think that's human nature and, and, and that's been a learning experience coming here yeah and working in this in this environment where that's kind of standard process yeah yeah, that's really amazing, actually. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's I, all, always a pleasure. Um, it's. Uh, I'm glad I could get help. Uh,